Welcome to the Hump Day Hanger Presentations, sponsored by SuperCup.org and the Not So Straight and Level Podcast. I got one more housekeeping item to do. Uh, glad to have you here this evening. And um, before we launch into this week's program, uh, I want to talk about a couple reminders. A lot of you have been uh, on these deals before. Uh, so you can do questions through the chat, uh, both either on the YouTube chat or you can do them on the uh, chat right here uh, inside Zoom. There's a little chat box down if you click uh, on chat at the bottom. And uh, those questions, we may or may not answer them immediately. We may hold them till the end of the program, depending on what the question is and how the flow is going. But sometimes we interrupt the speaker if it makes sense to do so. Uh, when you send those questions, don't send them to the speaker. Send them to Laura or I or to everyone is fine also. Uh, that way uh, the, the presenter doesn't get to, has to deal with the chat box, which they may not even have open. So sometimes we miss a few questions when they get sent that way. So just bear that in mind. So really exciting next week's program uh, will be uh, yours truly and Mrs. yours truly are doing a presentation on our 2019 trip to the Bahamas and uh, all of the exciting things that happened to us on that trip and some ins and outs and do's and don'ts on how you could do that yourself. It's actually a pretty easy thing to do. It's a lot closer than you think and uh, really an incredibly general aviation friendly place. And, I, and uh, so we we're gonna share that stuff with you next week. For tonight, I'll talk a little bit about our presenter here. A short break from college ended up with an accidental trip to Alaska where Mike landed a summer job in Denali Park. Falling in love with the great outdoors led to a new life in Alaska. Bush pilot Don Sheldon introduced Mike to Super Cubs, which opened the wonderful world of flying, which led to spending a year in a remote cabin, then to a job guiding, and eventually to a career with the Alaska Department of Public Safety. In spite of himself, Mike survived shootouts, plane wrecks, bear encounters, and other fun adventures only the last frontier can provide and which became material for three books. After retiring from the troopers, Mike and his wife made another accidental trip, this time to North Idaho, where they ended up starting a mom and pop seaplane training business. After almost 20 years as an instructor and FAA designated pilot examiner for training seaplane students, Mike is again attempting to retire so he can have fun, just have fun flying his cub on floats. Welcome Mike Kincaid. Okay, you ready to share here? Anytime you are ready. And we got that one up again. How to do that? Okay, you want to do the, remember you want to share the application, not the screen? Yeah, I thought that's what it did. Okay, so we go back up to. Yep, go up to stop share. Stop share. And now try the share again and just click the application. Okay, let's see if that works. There we go. Sorry about that. That's beautiful. And then you just hit play on that and we'll be in good shape. Let's see, hit play up here. Yep, right along the top bar there. Where is that? A little to the left. Huh. It's, uh, it's actually, you're probably fine. It, it's just a little bar at the top. It's not gonna bother us. Okay. Well, let's see if we can get through it like this. Okay. Sorry about that little glitch there. <clears throat> Take me just a second here. It's all good. It's all good. Okay. On your end anyway. Okay. Thanks to Steve and Laura and everyone who's participating in these uh, presentations. I actually watch them on YouTube on a treadmill in the morning. Uh, please excuse some of my photos as more than a few were snagged from old videos some slides or weathered prints. I think they help illustrate the story. As I explain my mishaps, please don't think I'm making excuses as I have been personally present for any mistakes I've made in my life. I once gave a, um, I once gave a, a book promotion talk to a couple hundred people and I asked them how many in the audience ended up in a career that they thought they would when they were a little child. Only two did. There's a nurse from a medical family and a man who took over the family business. How about you folks? Grow up, you want to be a pilot, a bathroom cleaner, Gerhardt, a magician, or a lion tamer? A lion tamer. All right. That sounds like a good plan. And you are how old? How old? I'm five. Okay. 
okay, at five, he wanted to be a lion tamer, uh, which he works for Amazon now, so that's pretty close, I guess. Piloting was never a planned career choice for me. Unlike many pilots, I didn't follow the usual course of falling in love with aviation as a kid, peering through an airport fence. As a matter of fact, a childhood event made me terrified of flying. Maybe it was standing next to a fellow student the first day of eighth grade when another student walked up and killed him with a one shot from a 22. And maybe it was the consolation prize for becoming a witness to a murder in that eighth grade day. I got a bus trip ticket downtown to see a parade and that was the JFK parade in Dallas. Maybe it was watching uh, To Kill a Mockingbird but something gave me the urge to get into logs. So I started my pre-law program at SMU then went on to University of Texas. Learning more about the legal profession induced me into taking an aptitude test to see if maybe I wasn't cut out to be an attorney. When the test indicated I should seek a profession involving law enforcement and outdoors work, I laughed off the results. For I was a city boy who thought getting traffic tickets just to beat him in court was good practice for my future career. I'd hate that kid today. So during my Summer break, I decided to take my first road trip. I ended up in uh, Oregon. In Oregon, I met a guy who said, hey, you need to go to Alaska, you're so close. So we took off in my van. 1,400 miles of dirt road later, uh, that poor old van limped across the border. When I got to Alaska, I probably had 150 bucks in my pocket. Now, have any of you in your career someday, have you ever thought you made the wrong career choice? That's what I thought when I instantly became a hostage negotiator. The only training I'd had for that was from cop movies. I found myself with a rifle pointed to my chest inside the Good News Bay trading post. I watched the crazed guy's finger whiten more and more as he tightened the trigger thinking, this is gonna hurt. Then he pulled the trigger. Back to my summer vacation, after two very rainy weeks on the Kenai Peninsula and turning down teaching jobs in Cooper Landing, we were headed back to college when a guy in the campground said we should see Denali Park before we left. Turns out the Denali Hotel was desperate in need of help, so we took jobs there just for the summer. Living in a tent at Taklamika Campground, surrounded by wildlife, incredible scenery, and dramatic views of Mount McKinley, I knew I'd found my calling in, in Alaska. I just need to figure out how to make a living at it. Then I lucked into what may have been the best job that Alaska Airlines had to offer for the winter. As a night auditor desk clerk for Alaska Ski Resort, which was owned by Alaska Airlines, I finished the accounting in a couple hours, locked the doors to the hotel and slipped into the slopes open and then skied for free all day. Also had free flight benefits. So I got to see the state and the gay 90s airline which helped ease my fear of flying. Maybe it was a booze that flowed freely on those flights. That's actually the president of Alaska Airlines who are playing the banjo. They did anything to get people to fly back down. And I made a, uh, a, a trip up to Talkeetna, just kind of a side trip, tri trip and uh, ran into a guy named uh, Don Shell and he was a bush pilot there. And Don would change my career choice. He suggested I take advantage of what Vantage was called the open entry program where they were giving away free land. So he said, uh, let's jump in the 180 and we'll go up and, and take a look. And uh, it's it just his confidence the only thing that got me in that airplane because he was, he was a real engaging guy. And so I jumped in the plane and uh, the flight was enjoyable, but I still wasn't sure about flying in a small plane. Uh, I never had built anything bigger than a uh, crooked uh, little uh, stool and wood shop. So I got a book by a guy named Bradford, Bradford Angier and I nailed it to the tree and built this little 12 by 17 shack, which would be our home for a year. And Don's uh, hobby, Don Shell's hobby was uh, crafting things out of wood burls. Uh, I call them tree cancers out of, out of uh, trees. And so I would haul those into town. As realtors say, location, location. The site selection of my cabin was based on the view of the mountains, the creek below, which is full of salmon, trout, and grayling, and a very nice trail at what would be just out my front door. The first night, we were in a wall tent, and a black bear ripped open the side of our wall tent and stuck his claw inside. I can tell you black bear tastes much like pork. Another time, around midnight, 
After a long day of skinning logs, I heard what I thought was my pet dog at the steps of the cabin. Knowing my dog had a sense of humor, I snuck up to scare him. Well, it wasn't my dog, but one of the trail users. I just about bumped into his massive chest with my nose. Froze in place for a second, I ran to the smoldering campfire and tossed some white gas into it. His flames blazing in the sky, I think the big brute was laughing at me as he crashed into the woods, tearing a new trail. I guess I should have known, but the closest neighbor about 10 miles away, I didn't actually build on a human trail. That was a game trail, bear trail. I used to go uh, to, I, I need to go to Alaska with Bill Rusk or Ted Waltman, as it seems they only meet friendly bears or none at all on their trips. After having a coworker dragged from his lean-to by a grizzly, tossed around like a doll, then being buried by the bear, so the bear could come back later and finish him off, uh, he actually lived, uh, minus his scalp and, and uh, minus full use of his shoulder. And I also worked a few um, horrific maulings in my career, so now I find comfort in toting a 12-gauge shotgun loaded with Greenicky slugs, alternated with double lock buck on my Alaska adventures. My theory is a bear will only attack if he wants to. Knowing nothing about dog teams, I decided to buy one. I bought an entire setup of seven dogs, harnesses, lines, and a sled for 300 bucks. And that became my winter mode of transportation, mostly to Talkeetna for supplies. I kept the dogs separated as not only did they like to fight each other, but the five females came in the heat all about the same time that winter. One night, there was a lot of commotion in our dog lot, the company, but it sounded like wolf howling. Sure enough, the next morning, there were wolf tracks all around the dogs, but not one was injured. That spring, we had 32 wolf dog pups. Last night, coincidentally, my son uh, called us from Fairbanks and he has a pack of wolves hanging around his cabin on the Chattanooga, and he keeps the dog inside. It was on one of those Talkeetna trips, this is my, this is my daughter, my wife, it's one of those Talkeetna trips that a, uh, a guide asked me if I would like to go up and help find some missing climbers on Mount McKinley. They were, uh, he had dropped some off and several of them didn't check in, so he was worried. So I said, sure, sounds like fun. So we landed and uh, kind of got buried in the snow fairly deep and uh, all the climbers showed up, so that was good news. But now we had this really deep snow to contend with. And where we had landed was up on top of about 14,000 foot uh, level. And at the end of us, there was a little ridge and on that ridge, I walked to it, and there was a, like a chasm that dropped down to the valley uh, to, uh, to look up to the bottom of, of, of an abyss. And so the plan was, we got all the climbers to snowshoe a trail, and the guide told me to run alongside hanging onto the strut. And I was in my bunny boots, so it was hard to run, but I did, kept pushing the strut. And then all of a sudden, he says, jump in. So I'm thinking we're going to get, you know, to the edge of that thing, turn around, come back, and keep in our tracks and take off. But no, he goes off that ledge down to that chasm with me hanging out my bunny boots out in the air as we're diving down. And that's when I thought this flying thing can be fun. Uh, this is my first crash. Uh, one of the assignments with the uh, guide was to build a log lodge on the Towshillet River. On the way back from our first trip there, the 185 you chartered, decided it had enough flying for the day and uh, just quit. And fortunately it landed in this, uh, this little black spruce. And if anybody knows what those are in Alaska, they're spindly little junky trees. And it, um, for, it absorbed the impact and a little damage done to the plane and, and no injuries, fortunately. I was way in the back in a jump seat. After the lodge was built, and by the way, the lodge was pretty much built by a Montana cowboy and me. We were dropped off with a Sears tent, a chainsaw and two skidoos in the winter to start this project. And we took all the trees off that, what is now the airstrip and started building this lodge. And that's how it looks today. Still great fishing. Some of the fish cut out of here. Uh, it just, it's a really incredible fishing. And I really enjoyed the guiding once the lodge was built. I didn't so much like packing moose. I uh, had a guy named Ray Janae who was a, was a mountain climber that could pack like crazy. And it's hard for me to keep up with that guy, but uh, that was a miserable part. But uh, I didn't necessarily enjoy the packing and I didn't necessarily enjoy the ethics of uh, guiding back in the 70s, a lot of problems. So I decided that's not what I want to do the rest of my life. So during a stint working on the Alaska pipeline in Valdez, I was befriended by a local trooper. And he told me of a new division of troopers that were going to be enforcing wildlife laws. Well, I envisioned working with wildlife uh, like 
is flying around in beautiful airplanes, protecting a resource. Well, I should have been alerted to Sitka Academy when we were all issued blue uniforms, or maybe when the first two weeks was homicide investigation followed by traffic. But really, I was so busy working out, studying, and cleaning my assigned area, the first, first of bathrooms, and I got promoted to laundry. And terrified of the screaming first sergeant and sadistic commander, I really didn't question anything. I just hung in there. During the uh, last week of the academy, assignments came out. Like the majority of classmates, I figured I'd be sent to Anchorage, Fairbanks, or Juneau. The usual course was to do two years under close supervision, then be transferred to a remote post. But apparently, because I had Bush experience and was working on my pilot certificate, my graduation letter congratulated my, me on my new post, King Salmon. I knew that as a fish, not a town, and I had no idea where it was. So I pulled out a map and this is where it was. I envisioned housing that looked something like this. Now this is the McGrath Trooper post. And that's what I thought it would look like. I'd, had this, I'd get this beautiful log cabin on the Knack Knack River. That proved to be incorrect. Here's my ride to King Salmon. I was ordered to report to the uh, to the uh, International Fire Anchorage on a Sunday uh, after graduating the academy and sit on Friday and said, have all your stuff there in your vehicle. After a couple hours of helping the grizzled pilot and the loadmaster, uh, who also was a co-pilot, load my stuff, we wobbled to take off in this old beater 1940s C-119 flying boxcar. I clearly remember this pilot chomping the uh, cigar and cussing loudly when the, one of the engines coughed and spurted over the mountains and we lost Quite a bit of altitude, it seems like. Somehow you got it restarted and we uh, made King Salmon late that day. The boxcar crew threw my stuff on the ramp and said goodbye. There I was standing down the ramp from the wing terminal, wing airlines, wondering what to do next and where the log cabin trooper housing might be. Fortunately, a mechanic work on a plane outside knew where my dream house was. With a chuckle, he offered the POS Marlette across the road, pointing his wrench over yonder. I didn't know what a Marlette was, but it sounded fancy. So I thought it might be the name of the log craftsman who built this beautiful log house for me. I thanked the mechanic and followed the direction pointed to by his wrench. Well, it wasn't made out of logs. It was made out of wrinkled metal and it wasn't fancy. The Marlette was a single wide trailer perched on cinder blocks. The paneled interior walls were streaked with mold from the ice which formed in the winter and thawed in the spring. In the orange shade carpet showed evidence of the St. Bernard that lived with the former trooper. The furniture puffed stuff into the cushions and the whole place smelled like cigarette smoke and dirty socks. And during the night, the violent shaking and horrendous thundering made me aware what it meant to live next to an Air Force base with F-4 fighters often scrambling to our border with Russia. It was also that night that I realized I should have more thoroughly checked out the job description of my law enforcement job. For it wasn't to be anything like my college aptitude test I should be doing in the great outdoors. This picture is how I remember that night, my first of many responses to a bar fight. When I answered the phone, the first emergency call, I responded with, no, I'm the wildlife officer. <laughs> the bartender laughed, telling me that in very colorful language that I had a lot to learn. It turns out back in those days, the job entailed being the city police, the trooper, the jail guard, if you couldn't find temporary labor, and the occasional prosecutor when court was held. And when the busiest red salmon fish in the world took place, the wildlife work actually began. By the way, after the first couple of times of rushing code to a bar fight, I would take my time, have a cup of coffee, and mosey over to the bar to find everyone had made up and the scene was calm. I didn't come back with a ripped shirt. When reinforcements came out for fishery patrols, I got my first seaplane ride. Bristol Bay is the world's largest sockeye fishery with about 1,900 vessels like this, all 32 feet in length, and they combat fish in the bay. The pilot was a bit on the wild side, so I had no second thoughts about landing in the rough seas of Bristol Bay in a Super Cub on Edo 2000 floats. After boarding a big tender and writing a few tickets, we sort of crash took off into the high waves. That was fun, and maybe I still don't mind rough water and seaplanes. After things settled down at the end of the hunting season, it was my time to get serious about getting my pilot certificate. My first plane was a bargain 85 horsepower T-Craft for $4,000. After polishing my prized possession, I found a CFI. He walked up to the plane, saw what he said were hardware bolts attaching the wing struts and refused to instruct me for some reason. 
He said, I need to dump that plane right away and find a real plane. I've sold that plane to a native fellow from a village. He loaded his wife in the right seat, his two drunk brother-in-laws, a couple of cans of gas and her groceries and wobbled off this village airstrip and neck neck back to his village. He made it almost halfway through the winter before he killed himself in a delivering drugs to a village, I understand. Um, my next plane was a big improvement and it's, I'm sorry about this bad picture, but this is a uh, 140. There's also a 180 parked here nearby I'll talk about. But I flew every minute I could get away from work and I was ready for my check ride in the spring. Unfortunately, the FAA examiner came out to King Salmon, refused to get the check right in the winds. It was Gus in the 54, and it was a terrible airplane, of course. Uh, any of you have flown into King Salmon know it's wide enough to land diagonally into the wind, but she didn't care. Pointing to a low wing plane, she said, I need to use something like that for my check ride. She gave me an hour to work it out, saying if we didn't get the ride done that day, it'd be two months before she was back in town. I found the owner of the, uh, of the Cherokee, is it. And asked him to uh, check me out. He said, I don't have time. Here are the keys. Good luck. Never had flown a tricycle gear uh, plane before this. I was pretty much lost in it, but boy, it sure was a lot easier in the wind. Ruth Obach, the examiner, was just glad to get down uh, and out of that wind. And she scratched out my temporary certificate and said, be careful. Good luck. A deal came along on a heart rod beater in very light 1954-180. And that's what I really learned to fly in using the Alaska Peninsula beaches for my runways. The only problem, the former owner was a bandit big game guide, so the plane would automatically dive at any bears I flew over. But I hauled freight to our patrol camps on my own time and when needed to build time. So I got my pilot wings at the end of the season. And here I am uh, with, the, with the Super Cub, and that's my dog partner. And partner was a great uh, partner to have in the back of the airplane. He didn't complain about my flying. Uh, but one time I'm going along, uh, I was on actually on floats, fairly low over the water, and the uh, plane went into an uncontrollable dive. It just wasn't good. Kept pulling back. I couldn't get any aft stick. I turned around and he had fallen asleep between the stick and the back seat. And he didn't know why I was hitting him on the head to get him up. But uh, fortunately, we got up before we uh, hit the water. And that way, Dodge now has a really neat box that goes over the back stick just for that purpose. Bill Rusk uh, had a clip of a blue 185 landing on the water in Southeast. And that would have been flown by a state trooper. An important part of the Department of Public Safety is the aviation section. We had about, uh, there were about 40 aircraft in the fleet and six mechanics full-time on staff to keep them running. Unfortunately, uh, the Goose program is shown right here that uh, we had three uh, Goose aircraft uh, ended when two troopers were killed uh, trying to navigate down the cliff in the Haines. And so that uh, they got rid of all of them. We also had uh, these uh, Hiller 12Es when I started with the department. Uh, one of them puked the engine and sank in Bristol Bay, leaving one in the fleet. And they said, time to retire those. This is a big improvement day after day of these R44s, of course. This is Bob Larson. And uh, Bob was uh, a pilot I flew with a lot in the Bell 206. Really great pilot and a lot of fun to fly with. Here we are up in uh, Talkeetna, actually. Unfortunately, Bob was killed in a uh, helicopter crash in icing conditions. The Eurocopter replaced uh, the bells for the troopers. Okay, flying around in nice aircraft in the beauty of Alaska can be enjoyable, but there's a downside. Like law enforcement, lower 48, 48 use cars to race the hot calls. Bush troopers, troopers use airplanes. And they often put aside normal safe piling procedures, the ultimate goal of get their itis, hoping maybe they can save a life and put in putting their own in jeopardy in the process. Next time the pursuit vehicle races past you on the road, think of a trooper doing the same thing in a Cub 185 or a helicopter with all the pressure of fighting weather and preparing mentally for what he have to do once he gets there. So you see since state had half of all troopers who have died on duty or been to because of airplane crashes. Patrol vessel Stimson is named for a wildlife trooper killed in a helicopter crash during search and rescue. He was a great guy, uh, friend, but he broke his own rule of being prepared with equipment for search and rescue and he succumbed, succumbed to the uh, elements overnight in a crash. The Marine section, by the way, um, patrols the almost 34,000 miles of Alaska coastline with 17 vessels. They range from 25 to 156 feet long 
And the troopers are out to sea for 30 to 45 days and often gone from home up to 120 days a year. I was on the vessel for four days, that was enough for me, but in the helicopter, we used to drop the mail and supplies uh, off to the, to the big ships. So uh, there's a difference between uh, law enforcement in lower 48 and Alaska. Um, as probably you know, Alaska contains a, a lot of miles, about four, 586,000 square miles of land. It's one fifth the size of the lower 48, and that's what this shows. 488 times larger than Rhode Island and two and a half times larger than Texas and larger than the next three largest states in the U.S. combined. It gives you about 93 square miles for each person in the state. When I retired, and I don't think it's improved, there were only about 200 uniformed troopers in both divisions for the entire state. Larger cities have police departments, but there are no sheriff departments in Alaska. So the troopers handle everything outside the cities. Troopers might handle a moose poaching one day and a homicide the next, doing everything from the investigation to hauling the body to town. And here's the difference. Um, by the way, a, a, some days a trooper, just like any job, you know, might feel like he shouldn't be paid for patrolling the beauty of, in Alaska. Other days, it's like there's not enough money in the world to make it worthwhile for what he's having to do. Here's the difference between the uh, Alaska Department of Sa uh, Public Safety and Law 48. Here's a photo from our local paper, uh, and this is showing the Committee of Law Enforcement Officers that greeted a bad driver at the end of a high-speed pursuit. In Bush, Alaska, it's quite often one guy, and backup is sometimes days away because of weather and location. One time I was flying um, from um, Nome to Bethel and going over the Bering Sea, and uh, it got close to a village, and there was a dispatch called me. Um, and said, hey, we got a, uh, a native, a drunk native um, shooting up a fish camp. So I met, so um, I know he's up in a tent and there's absolutely in this particular place, uh, there was no cover at all, no trees, nothing, no hill. You landed down in a slough and then all these tents are up on top and uh, he was up on one of them shooting. So I didn't have a lot of cover. Um, I think the statute of limitations is passed, so I, can, I told him my book how I solved the issue, but anyway, he uh, got arrested and I took him to jail and no one got hurt, fortunately. It was my lucky day, really. Uh, here's hunting patrol on the Alaska Peninsula and uh, one of our cabins there. When I flew into this, this day, uh, there was a mama grizzly bear with four cubs and three of those cubs were normal size and one was a little shorty, so I think it was adopted. As I walked around this uh, little cabin here, I surprised a lynx. It was kind of cool. Here's another adventure on the Alaska Peninsula. So I'm flying around the, uh, the peninsula, minding my own business, and there was just a little bit of smoke, not this much smoke, just a little bit of smoke. So I flew over to it and said, well, that's weird, you know, because there's nobody, there's no reason for anybody to be on the Alaska Peninsula that day. There's, there are no villages, no nothing, no camps, there's no hunting, there's nothing going on. So I thought, well, maybe it's a plane crash. So I flew over there and it's just kind of weird. There's smoke coming out from the ground and I saw something kind of red down there. So I went back to town and got my 180 um, and thought I'd come back and get some pictures. Turned out to be one of the most exciting flights of my career. As I'm flying over, taking pictures of the, uh, this smoke had died down when I got there and it was just lava next. I saw this lava and I thought, man, that's really cool. So I got these pictures that I sold to Alaska Magazine and then that's what it looked like, uh, it was in the magazine. And then the volcano erupted. Now, if any of you have been in an updraft, you know, that could be pretty exciting. This was the most exciting updraft of my life. It went straight up and every little flaming rocks hit me under my wings and on the fuselage and it just kept going up. I thought I was never gonna stop going up. Very exciting flight. And that's what it looks like today. And you can actually land a cub on floats and take off in uh, that little lake in the foreground. This is, uh, if anybody's ever fished at Iliamna, this is Tulare Creek. And uh, some natives um, decided it was a good idea to go there and put a net across Tulare Creek in the winter. And they took 82 rainbows. So I landed on the beach there and told them that wasn't really a legal thing to do. I put five of them in the plane for evidence and said, you guys go back to Iliamna and your skiff with the other 77 and uh, we'll work it out there. They actually swamped the boat and lost all 77 of the fish. And 
uh, that place where they uh, sit and set their net happened to be owned by the governor. And he had his cabin there. He was a guide, Jay Hammond. Uh, so the guy's got 60 days in jail for doing that. And stay deserved. This is a guy named Willie the Weed. And this is a cartoon of this. I don't have a picture. But Willie the Weed uh, needed some money for weed. He came into a village, from a village. And he broke into a house and knack-knack through the window stole the ring and he tried to steal other stuff. He actually went into the living room and the people are sitting there watching TV. So they tried to steal the lamp and they said, no, Willie, you can't have our lamp. So they went over and tried to lift the TV up. You know, you can't take our TV. He wanted something to steal and sell for drugs. So all the time there's this little poodle, yapper snapper, bark at him. So he decided he'd steal the poodle. I met him as he's walking down the road. Now the poodle is no longer in his arm, it's actually biting him just like this and with part of his ear in his mouth. <clears throat> so I, I, knew I, had, I knew I had the right guy. So I took him to jail and the jail was in Knack Knack. A little rundown jail, it's kind of like Andy and Mayberry and I was Barney, I guess I was upstairs and doing my report. This guy was so skinny that he, he got between the bars and he snuck out and I had no idea. And so he thought he was going to commandeer a snow machine and make his escape back to his village. Well, they, fortunately, the bar owner, who was also the mayor, his wife was the mayor of, the, of Nat Nat, he figured it out. So he just made a series of circles around the town. The guy thought he was back in his village, and he took him back to the courthouse and gave him to me. So I had my guy back in custody. This is a not such a, this is a sadder case. I got called to Equok. Uh, and this was my first homicide case. At this time, the uh, Dillingham Police Department was on strike or something. There was no trooper in Dillingham, no trooper anywhere. Sent me and uh, had to go there and follow the blood tracks and ended up in a meat cache where I found a husband and wife stuffed on top of each other. The person who shot him was a student and the motive for shooting is he wanted to borrow their truck and to go for a drive. Uh, he'd never driven a vehicle and the truck was the only truck in town and was in snow. It had been snowing all winter and it was probably in, covered in six feet of snow, so it wasn't even possible. So he took it out on them. 14 years old. Transferred to Glen Allen uh, and the pipeline mayhem was still going on, lots of fights in the camps and uh, although construction pretty much over, there's still a lot going on in the camps, so it was pretty exciting. I had one of my first, uh, I Wrangell Mountains. That's how we preheated the uh, airplanes. Okay, so we have the uh, Dunning-Kruger effect. And as you see down here, uh, I was sort of down here, almost Ben's metal. And then I got up to, or I think I'm a master pilot. Actually, Alaska is called the Bush pilot syndrome. You get about 150 hours, you think you can do anything. And uh, I was just about getting over here to comes to understand prior stupidity, but no, nope, I had to do something stupid first. So I thought, uh, it's a great idea. And I can just tell you, don't land a heavy state cub with two guys in heavy winter gear on wheel skis in the tracks of a super light cub with big land as straight skis. The state cubs we had were loaded with radio gear, IFR panels, EMT supplies, and accessories. One guy even had a burrito warmer built into his uh, through the heating system. They were often the office of troopers on patrol. My record was 17 and a half hours in a cub on one ship. So we put a lot of time in them and they were really, really heavy. And this one sank right up to the wings and we spent the night up there at the base of Mount Wrangell, Wrangell in very, very cold temperatures. And the snow was sugar snow. There's no way it was ever gonna set up. So we had to take a track vehicle in there and make an airstrip. And incidentally, when we took off, I was, now by the time we made the strip, I'm still down in kind of a hole. And as I take off on the first attempt, I bend the uh, elevator. So we put a new elevator in it. Everything's great and I take off and the mechanic is flying alongside me and I realize I'm in a climb and I can't get out of it. The rudder is, the elevator is jammed all the way back, sticks all the way back. Uh, I can't push it forward. Well, fortunately I'm up really high in elevation and I'm going down to Gulcanus so uh, I can afford to practice my stalls because that's what I would, all I could do. I kept stalling and, and, uh, and recover. And so the mechanic said, uh, hey, why are you practicing stalls, Mike? And said, you know, trying to get the plane back. I said, hey, I can't do anything. It's jammed. You got any ideas? And he said, let me think about it. And he got back to me about two long minutes later and says, nope, I don't have any ideas. Well, all of a sudden, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I had to trim all the way forward. And all of a sudden, as we get lower, after about my 50th stall, the airplane 
goes into a dive and it made this horrendous sound when it did this big echoing sound from the back. So I thought I'd lost a tail, I thought I was done. What had happened, we found out that snow had jammed in a jack screw and frozen. As we got down the lower, it melted fortunately. Another exciting day. Uh, this is the best way to fish, I think, at a fish will buy our house in Copper Center. Great. Anybody been to McCarthy? Nice town. There, uh, one of my uh, most horrible things today on job was uh, when six of my friends in McCarthy got murdered by a crazy guy. His plan was to uh, uh, commandeer a helicopter and uh, and smash it into the pipeline, somehow blow up the pipeline. So he decided to kill six people and innocent people, uh, mom and pop who had the uh, post office there in town. And one guy was a friend of mine who actually had been the winter previous there on a homicide investigation. I got stuck at his cabin outside of McCarthy for four days in a blizzard, a guy named Harley King. Harley had 20,000 hours in a super cub. And he said, that's the only plane I want to fly because I'm pretty good at it. Why screw up my, my flying if I, by flying something else? Well, Harley was taking a girl in to meet the mail plane when the shooting was going on and he figured it out. And so he let the girl uh, run, told her to run. And he took two shots for her, saved her, his life, but uh, he didn't make it, unfortunately. It's my first book I wrote about that. Um, probably heard you can run, you can't hide. Well, the illegal guy who owned this cup actually hid it for about a week in these trees. And it was only found by a fluke and I had to be flying back to Glen Allen. And, and from there, a, a light hit it just right. And it appeared from these trees. And I decided, yeah, hey, I might as well go ahead and drop, take one last look. And sure enough, it was the right number. Like this airplane, uh, airplanes are, that are used illegally in Alaska for hunting or other crimes are seized and often forfeited. And if they're good enough, they become patrol aircraft because they're junk there. This for, they're just uh, auctioned. This one was uh, turned into patrol aircraft, but the guy got the last laugh because a wing separated on takeoff from Alaska Peninsula Strip after it had been tied down overnight and extreme winds. It landed inverted in the Sandy River with both troopers surviving after they got rescued by a guide. Uh, the Atlee Dodge tie down brackets, which go over the front spar, uh, they remove the tie down loads from the front lift strut uh, in that little U channel, take care of this. And I highly recommend those if you can be tied down in winds. Uh, if you're going to hunt and fish in Alaska, I highly recommend you know the rigs. Alaska takes protection of those resources very seriously. And wildlife laws are some of the toughest in the books. There's an old saying, matter of fact, it says, you can get away with killing your wife. Sorry, Laura, <laughs> but you say, you've, let's change that to spouse. You can get away with killing your spouse, but you better not poach a moose in Alaska. That's an old saying. Uh, if you waste game, the sentence is a mandatory without passing go, seven days in jail to serve without any of it suspended. Judge doesn't have that power to suspend any of it. $2,500 fine and forfeiture of guns and equipment like airplanes. So make sure you know the regulations if you go to Alaska. Responding to and investigating aircraft accidents was a big part of the job. Uh, we would haul out survivors or bodies, depending on what happened. And uh, we did an initial report for the NTSB. The NTSB actually uh, would not go out into the bush for non-commercial wrecks. And they provided us with uh, a quick course uh, every year on what they wanted in their reports. Um, we had uh, some examples of some of the crash besides this one. Uh, this was what guy chasing the coyote and <laughs> he got so engrossed in chasing the coyote around right into this uh, cliff and he actually walked out minor injuries walked out to a lodge like 15 miles in the snow on snowshoes and survived. Uh, there was another one uh, not so lucky uh, two cubs were in tandem and the guy in the, the lead plane came across a pack of wook, uh, wolves by Tyone Lake. The guy in the back pulled out a shotgun and it went off and shot the pilot in the back of the head. They crashed. Another guy shot a strut off his uh, cub up in the book range. He didn't make it either. <clears throat> Citizen uh, reported, uh, called in on a, on a radio to the trooper dispatch in Glen Allen reporting a crash of a 185 with multiple injuries. Our trooper office was just down the street from the hospital. So I called this young doc and we were airborne, airborne in 20 minutes with medical gear, backboard strapped to the struts and everything we could load in the plane ready to treat for survivors. We full throttled to Lake Louise where we found this tater craft. 
more than 185 obviously, with only the pilot who is deceased. This poor guy was an Anchorage police officer, had a great weekend and he's buzzing his friends on takeoff and stalled and crashed, unfortunately. Here's another learning moment. Fish and game was planning on killing a beaver. It was damming up the, the river and flooding the highway. A young, well-meaning trooper offered to fly the beaver out to a new home. It's a beaver there in a trap. <clears throat> if the biologists would just trap it, and they did. Turns out the beaver didn't appreciate the gesture, and after being released from the trap, jumped back onto the float and attacked the trooper. That's where the crossover cable mentioned last week in George Campbell's uh, talk uh, came in very handy, I can tell you. And I was able to get away from the beaver and get back on the point. Uh, this is good times. Uh, we had this remote post that the attorney in Anchorage would let us use. It was an old lodge at uh, Tyon River. And we'd base out there during honey season for a month. And uh, one night we had, uh, uh, we had a plane crash and they left two guys out on a caribou hunt. Didn't tell anybody where he dropped them. No one had an idea. We just knew there were two guys out there really going to be hurting for food. So I flew all day, couldn't find them. So I had this idea, this is in the Osha in the mountains, to fly at night in the mountains. I just got a high altitude and the weather was really nice. Got a lot of stars. Got up high and flew at night until I found a campfire. And I was able to mark it on a chart and go back there the next day and tell the two guys that uh, you know, probably had been killed. And they were, they were really glad to be found actually. But uh, also at this, uh, at this post, I would, uh, uh, was loaned to the Department of Fish and Game for flying. They, it was cheaper for them to uh, just pay our, our fees for the airplane. And uh, we would uh, put telemetry gear on the uh, wing struts, uh, antennae. And uh, my job in the winter, I would track multiple wolf packs using the radio is by myself, document the kills and then mark them on, on the uh, charts. Uh, in the spring, we would actually uh, track, uh, find bears for them and wolverines and we called them in with their helicopters so they could tag them. Rescues was a big part of the job, uh, mostly very stinky moose hunters, not fair faucet lookalikes like this gal who was climbing Mount Blackburn and uh, it hurt her knee very badly. And uh, I flew her out. Well, we had a, the airstrip was right behind the trooper housing in Glen Allen. And so I brought her up on crutches and that's my daughter. And she came up and I introduced her and my daughter said, dad, you can't keep her. So here, uh, this is another uh, learning moment. Uh, looks on this guy's about to do something really stupid. Okay, if anybody's been up on uh, this particular highway, there's a place called uh, Sourdough Lodge. So we got a call, middle of the night, and uh, so it was, I think it was around 2, 2 a.m. actually, and uh, there was a report of a family that had gone up by boat and the boat had capsized, and they were cold and, uh, and had no gear. And it was a, a mom and two, two little uh, toddlers and a man. The man, coincidentally, was a Hawaii police officer who had been shot in line of duty and was coming over to recuperate for a nice calm vacation. And he took a boat up and, and capsized it. So um, I flew up and uh, I was going to land on the road. We did a lot of uh, landings on highways in Alaska. It's, it's not illegal, by the way. The only thing that's illegal about it is you, you don't have a registered vehicle, obviously, and you don't have an over with permit. But other than that, uh, size equipment and there's nothing really wrong with Alaska. So I was gonna land on the highway and uh, made a pass that looked good, came back and landed and I uh, saw a boat that I was gonna borrow and go up and rescue the guys and everything was gonna be great. Uh, not so much. I came in and landed set up for this really nice landing uh, right off the bridge. And all of a sudden the plane slammed and jerked violently to the left. What I could see is that big white tank, which was full of gas and the two tanks to the right full of more gas. And that's what I thought, well, this is gonna be over very quickly because I'm gonna hit those. Uh, that's where I was aiming. Somehow I was able to uh, wobble down into that park lot and make a turn and get back up on the road. And uh, now I see a fog bank in front of me about a mile. So I know I got to start making a turn. I look out and there are all kinds of things hanging out the left wing. Um, the other one wasn't working on that side. and. Uh, all kinds of fabric and metal hanging out. Uh, fortunately, I was able to get back to uh, Gokana and get a vehicle and go back and rescue these guys. But that, uh, what was interesting, if I would have been able to make a approach the other way, I had the fog bank to contend with, but uh, no excuses, I still should have been able to do it. 
the road sign, which was gray on the side, from my point of view, was bright green and white on the other side, so it would have shown up. So if you ever land on a highway, uh, go both ways and, and scan for signs. Here's I am on loan to the Department of Fish and Game. Now, Fish and Game preferred uh, paying expenses for a wildlife trooper for some missions. Uh, after pilots and guides uh, one time returned after dropping off biologists uh, who had tranquilized a couple of wolves and collared them, and they dropped off the biologists and went back and killed the wolves <laughs> for the skins. So they decided we were probably a safer bet. Um, so in my career, I actually uh, released two live wolves and traps and a fox, but uh, this particular one went in with the biologist and uh, some street skis and we snowshoed in there and he shot it with a tranquilizer. The, the guide had told the biologist this wolf had been out there for a couple of days, actually probably two weeks and was hungry. So the wolf turned around and grabbed the uh, dart out of its rump and swallowed it. So there's no way he could have passed that to without uh, killing himself. So I had an idea, I flew over to Lake Louise Lodge, got a big can of lard and came back and I hand fed lard to that uh, wolf. And uh, he sobered up and he's still, he's alive here by the way, and he got off the influence of the drugs and, and walked away. Passed the dart, obviously, because uh, two weeks later, uh, they got a mortality beep on the sensor and found out that the wolf had been killed by a moose that kicked him in the head. The wolf like apparently was gonna try to take on the the moose and uh, one on one didn't work for it. So that was kind of an expensive uh, and kind of tragic into the, the wolf, I guess. Uh, George discussed counting salmon for fishing game in canyons, at very low altitudes, very, very steep turns. And I did that and I thought there was a lot of fun. The biologists would sit in the back and collect the salmon we could spot with a counter. Uh, but the most fun was I took a biologist uh, for steelhead fishing and his mission was to catch the steelhead and um, measure them and uh, clip them, clip the fence to identify them. And uh, we caught so many steelhead a day, it was the best fish I think we've ever had. Okay. It's not advancing here. Okay, so I had to shoot up in a cabin. And this is a cabin on a lake out of Copper Center. So my mission that day was to go to uh, up to this cabin and uh, figure out why somebody was shooting up. It was one of the village elders and there was just no reason anybody wanted to shoot up our cabin. So I took, uh, found a, I found ski traps for a super cub, which was interesting. We figured if anybody's gonna be shooting up a cabin, it's probably kids and it's, um, you know, they're probably just doing it for fun. So it'd be snow machine tracks but no ski tracks. So I measured the cub tracks, got the bullets. And then I went on, uh, it's a book I wrote about this by the way. And then I went on to my next post to Fairbanks and the bullets got left and evidence locker. And after a couple of years, they got thrown out. Well, it turned out to be a serial killer and he'd shot up the cabin because there was a, a girl that was trying to escape from it apparently. We'll talk more about that. Uh, this is Fairbanks Post in, back in the 80s. And the guy on the right is Jim Lowe um, up in Fairbanks. And this shows that a Super Cub can fit just anybody because Jim's six foot eight as a Super Cub. Okay, this is a, actually a rocking chair. We had a trapper, an Indian trapper, and he was uh, an older guy and he died of uh, natural causes in his cabin and froze. So we get there and it's, uh, I'm not gonna say it was me, but the troopers that got there found it was very cold, you know, 20 below and he's frozen. So they scraped him out of the chair. They actually, what they did, used the rocking chair for sort of a sled and they sledded him out to the 185, got him out of the chair and they put him in the back of the 185. And the plan was just to fly the town and uh, everything would be great. He'd be, he'd bear, they would keep the heat off so he didn't thaw out. And it would be a nice simple flight, about an hour and a half flight. Well, sure enough, uh, dispatch calls, and now there's a Eskimo in another village who's drunk and shooting up the village. So the troopers have to go there. Well, the Indians and the Eskimos in that part of the country, a brook range, weren't getting along. So the Indian gets in the back and he starts uh, conversing with the, uh, the Eskimo gets in the back, starts conversing with the Indian who he didn't know was dead because his eyes are frozen open. And he starts yelling at him. 
the Eskimo, uh, the Indian won't respond to the Eskimo. So the Eskimo hits him. The Indian's head hits the side of the airplane and uh, bangs his head and his eyes go closed. And so now the Eskimo thinks he killed him. We didn't tell him otherwise. So we get to Fairbanks, we uh, take him out of the plane and he's profusely, profusely uh, apologizing for killing the Indian. And we said, well, I'll tell you what, we'll give you a warning, a verbal warning this time if you tell, you who you're, you tell us who your bootlegger was, you got the boot. So he did, he, he gladly gave us the name of his bootlegger. This is uh, in the uh, Arctic village. And this was uh, a guy uh, decided to have a shootout with the troopers. And he accused the troopers of, arse, of throwing a firebomb into his cabin to get him out. Well, they would never do that. And uh, we didn't do it. And so I flew out back and got the fire marshal. I said, okay, let's get the fire marshal to do a quick investigation and show what caused the fire. And it was cigarettes and smoldering uh, mattress. They've been having a party there for days. But anyway, we got the guy out, nobody got hurt. As we're loading up to fly over the Brooks Range, and this is going to be at night to fly through the Brooks Range uh, back to Fairbanks to put him in jail. I had the uh, old, um, the, the neat old guy, the fire marshal, and he carried a little um, pistol. And he turned around and he pointed the pistol in the guy's, uh, between his eyes, the native guy who was being pretty rambunctious, and said, if you do anything to interfere with this flight, I'm going to shoot you between your eyes. That became part of my pilot briefing for the rest of my career. I was a, just a great idea for rowdy passengers. Uh, this one didn't have such a happy ending. Uh, we had been chasing this guy for a while. He ended up in uh, Manly Hot Springs, killed a family, stole their boat. We found him on a dead end slough. Um, I got thrown an M16 and uh, I said, here, just shoot him out. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna get in a shootout with the guy off. So it's gonna end with a shootout, we knew that. So my job was to shoot from the back of the um, Super Cub. Uh, really bad idea, this guy was a real marksman. And so we got, to, we got to the point and he started shooting at us. We pulled up the Cub and got out of his range and the helicopter came in. And we, had, at that time, had two helicopters in the Cub and we had plenty of places to land. So we were trying to get the boss, the captain to land on the gravel bar. And then we had our SWAT team where we could approach and take the guy out, but unfortunately, uh, the captain had different ideas and came in sideways in a helicopter. So my good friend got killed in the back. Nine people all together, including one trooper. This is a big screw up. It was too bumpy in the mountains to, uh, to patrol that day. You see the lenticulars? And um, so I headed for low grounds. And this was kind of a, a, a landing like uh, Jeff and Jim showed in their videos last week requiring a slipped the final to a short field. It was about 450 feet with soft sand, so it was plenty long, but it had a little dog leg in it. So you had to, you had to do a little bit of technique. And the, the trees were really blown. So I came in and had a good head bump. All of a sudden I lost lift and I came through that brush and the prop was like a chainsaw. And uh, thinking the cub might catch on fire after I, I crashed, I jumped out very quickly. And I'm laying there uh, just making sure I'm okay. And the, the air was so still there were bugs flying over me. And I looked up and it's still, and I'm talking 50 feet above, the brush is really blowing like crazy. So it was, it was kind of interesting. And uh, I was ordered to prepare and deliver a presentation to pilots at our annual safety seminar on wind shear. I realized it was time to grow past the bush pilot syndrome and take flying more seriously. And I also realized I'd never be a 20,000 hour cub pilot like Harley King, so I should learn to fly complex airplanes as well. Within a year, I got my commercial instrument ratings and got my CFI the next year and became a check pilot for state. Even got my master's degree in adult education, developing a new training system for, for pilots. So I really changed my attitude about flying. Uh, this is that plane, that ugly brown plane after uh, the crash. And before the crash, I told my boss, I said, we've got to get that plane painted. It's so ugly. And so he thought I did it on purpose. Uh, we use uh, unmarked airplanes, just like unmarked police cars. Um, so always, uh, you never know who's camping next to you or fishing next to you in Alaska. I started a seaplane operation in Fairbanks, given ratings in this uh, 172, very underfloated with 2,000 floats. Here is beautiful Bethel. Uh, my new attitude, instrument rating, and authorization to fly all kinds of single-engine planes in our fleet would really pay off here. 
So if, to travel in Alaska, this is Bethel Beaches. It's a beautiful spot. Um, to get to where we're going in Alaska, we generally had to take a, a, a prisoner. We couldn't just go fly. If there was a prisoner, it had to be someplace because then Department of Corrections paid for it. It had to come out of our budget. So I took a prisoner trip, my first to look at Bethel. I <laughs> thought, oh man, can I change my mind? But there was a guy named Errol Samuelson there. Errol Samuelson had lots and lots of hours all in the Yukon Cusquim Delta. And I took an amazing flight with him to Hooper Bay. And uh, it was almost a total whiteout. I never saw the village. And he yelled at me, said, when you see the red house and then the blue house, tell me. And I said, OK. So I saw the houses out of my side window. And I said, OK, blue house. And he cut the power. And we landed on the strip. I never saw the strip. This guy was an amazing. He had a GPS built into his head. And he could tell how far we were out from the village by brush that I couldn't even see from the Hooper Village, Hooper Bay. So my second trip to Bethel, uh, another prisoner transport, and I was going to look for housing or maybe figure out a way to get out of Bethel transfer. Uh, I was called in the middle of the night to fly to a village where a kid had set the school on fire. Earl was upriver, so uh, I was led to the 207 in the hangar. And I flipped to the strip and it was underwater. I said, well, this doesn't look good. You know, the spring floods, everything was underwater. The trooper with me said, well, that's normal. So we landed and he was right. Muds came up all over the windscreen and airplane, water everywhere, but we were able to make it, call the guy back to town. Our first night in Bethel after staying up till midnight unpacking and Earl had taken off for a six week vacation to his fish camp. I was called at uh, two o'clock in the morning for a murder in a Prakowski. I'd never flown a 206, but the troopers who were with me said I could read the manual as we flew up. I said, okay, that's cool. Uh, I ran over to open the right door and guess what? There's no door on the right on it. No passenger door on the front on 206, I found out, kind of embarrassed. But we got up there and um, the guy was supposed to be held by the village police officer. Village police officers don't have guns, but they can kind of hold a guy that's uh, not fighting and, uh, and cause little archaic jail cells they have. And uh, he escaped, he walked out. So now we had to search through the woods for this guy for hours through the mud in the woods and uh, finally found him, brought him back. The victim he had killed was his brother. So it was kind of sad as we're flying back in the, uh, in the 206 and we had the body bag with the brother sitting next to him and the, next to the bloody body bag crying the whole time because he started sobering up and what he'd done. Alcohol is a big problem out there. Here I am, uh, kind of bulked up in my survival gear like the Mitchum man that kind of made my scrawny body look kind of big, but uh, I had my uniform and all my survival gear on under that that we wore to fly. The rule is what you're wearing is your survival gear. The gear in the back is your camping gear. And if you're lucky to retrieve it in a crash, that's great. But uh, we flew actually with the heat turned down so we could wear a lot of gear. So if we went down, we were always ready to survive. The state law in Alaska, by the way, lays out what's legal required for survival gear to fly. And George is totally right about the uh, crappy flying conditions in Bethel. And, you know, just consider a bunch of low time pilots just up from the lower 48, trying to build time, flying 200 feet AGL with one half mile visibility and no radar or ADSB. Like George, I made my own approach, which I consisted of a first generation GPS, you know, it didn't have a move map or anything. But that would get me to the Bethel runway. And then I hit a second uh, GPS and that led me to the Cuscrum River. If I could see the river, I knew I could chop the power and make a, a steep turn to the seaplane lake. So it's really kind of nice to have your own approaches out there. Fairbanks was cold, but Bethel is a step beyond. That was actually a wind chill one day. Now wisdom says you don't buy the nicest house in the neighborhood, but when it's the only one not made from a metal convict shipping crate, it might be the only chase, a choice. This one uh, was, I think, the only one that actually had a lawn at Bethel. So it was a pretty nice house. And that's what it looks like in the summer. You notice it's a two-story house. There it is in the winter. It's after a blizzard. The whole first floor is gone. And my job included uh, flying uh, for emergencies, uh, troopers, prisoner transport, supervising the wildlife posts of Kotzebue, Nome, Antioch, McGrath, and Bethel, and working with the Western Alaska narcotic, narcotic team. So I was gone quite a bit. When I was gone, it seemed like the 
furnace would go out. So my wife would have to go out. The furnace room was in the back of the house. So my wife would have to put all of her winter gear on, go around in the howling winds in the snowstorm and open the door and push the research, reset switch and hope the furnace came on. She loved it there. But the nice thing about that house is that out the back window, we could see the uh, blue taxi lights to the runway. And my, if my wife could see them, uh, fortunately the 185 I flew had a flight phone in it and it was tied into the uh, federal uh, repeaters they had out there. I could call her and if I could see that she could see the lights out the window, I could shoot the ILS. Uh, here's a typical village trip. There's no GPS. There's no uh, alternate to fly for IFR because it's too far away. And uh, most is done very close to the ground. Hopefully uh, everybody's given position reports and you just hope everybody else is. Uh, we get special VFRs to get out of Bethel and sometimes there'd be 22 planes waiting for a special on the ramp. And uh, if it, we had a emergency we responded to, we would tell the FA and fortunately they would, they would let us go first. It made everybody mad, but uh, it was an emergency we had to. Here's a fancy restaurant in Bethel, Nick Swanson's. If they were missing Malamute, we know what was gonna be on the menu that week. And here we are uh, in a patrol in a village set at fishery. Now this is a technique I developed after learning the hard way. You find the biggest, meanest kids in town and you bribe them with candy bars and balsa wood aircraft models to guard your airplane. Otherwise, they will use the wings for a diving board. They will help themselves to what's ever in the airplane if they can get in and uh, just uh, totally abuse your airplane. Not really mean to do any harm, it's just, that's the way it is. What we developed uh, for Super Cubs going into villages is we would take the gas caps and loosen them just about a quarter turn. If we came back after our business in the village and the gas caps were tight, we knew somebody had put something in the fuel. So we had a lot of draining to do. Here we are uh, on patrol uh, with the Antioch Trooper. We had a high-speed chase one night where the uh, Cub was actually caught this boat uh, fishing for the season open. And he also had, uh, he was bootlegging to villages and also had a minor girl with him. So he was committing sexual abuse of a minor. So it was a kind of important case. And so the guy had good reason to run. So he got in a high speed chase boat versus super cub. And he would land alongside him thinking the boat was gonna pull over. He would ram him. So he called me with a 185 and we were able to finally get him into a slough and get him caught, he finally gave up. Uh, George said last week that uh, it's smart to know how you're gonna get freight uh, that you get in out. This time I had two St. Mary's troopers to help, but uh, often, like one time I had two bodies and the trooper I took with me was Eskimo. Turns out he's superstitious, wouldn't crawl in the cave with me to get the bodies that would wash up there if they uh, sank their boat. And then he wouldn't help me get them out of the plane because he couldn't touch bodies, they were dead, turned out. So, and this is, uh, this is typical. We got this big boat, how you gonna, this big engine, how you gonna get it out? And it's good this time we had some help. But on this trip going back, this was in St. Mary's, they came up to me and said, oh, by the way, we have a prisoner for you to take back. And I said, well, what did he do? He's violent. He said, yeah, he was drunk shooting up the village last night. He's okay now. Said, okay, so I put him in the back. And what we would do, we'd shackle him to the um, seat rails and to the seat, the passenger seat in the back. And uh, we'd give him the briefing, of course, if you try anything, we'll shoot you. And uh, off we'd go. So I flew over the troopers at St. Mary's and just to say goodbye. And one of them got on the radio and said, hey, are you supposed to have a water coming out bottom of your float? And I said, uh, no, not really. And he, so I did a low pass and he said, you got about an 18, 18 inch rip in your float. So I knew that was gonna be a problem landing back in Bethel. So, uh, and by the way, I just topped off the fuel. I left Bethel, it was about a 45 minute flight. So I had lots of fuel. So I called and got really lucky. There's a, a big lake in, in Bethel and, uh, and a really small lake and the small lakes by the airport. I found a guy on the flight phone, they had a trailer, a snow machine trailer, and I asked him to kind of lower it uh, into the water. And I burned off all the fuel and the tank on the side where it had to rip in the float. And then I uh, landed on the other float, on one float, taxied up to that trailer, just like I knew what I was doing. It was the luckiest landing of my life. It worked out beautifully like I knew what I was doing. Came up on the trailer and stopped. And I helped the Eskimo, uh, the prisoner out of the back. And what he said to me when he got out of the plane, he said, Trooper, when I get out of jail, I know when to fly with you back to village. He just thought that's the way I flew all the time, I guess. This is uh, an illustration of the worst wind ever I flew in. 
If I stated the velocity, someone might pull out the BS bag or point out how stupid it was. However, this was in response to a shootout in the village and we had two troopers pinned down being shot at. A sniper villager with an assault rifle from the tallest building in town, two-story house. Unfortunately, he decided it was the day to be shot by a trooper, I guess, because he was shooting at little kids. He, he shot a dog and he was shooting at everybody that uh, he could, anything that moved. And he started shooting the troopers, shooting the troopers had them pinned down. So they had to take them out to keep anybody uh, innocent getting, from getting killed. It was way too windy to land there with the 206 on wheels. Uh, it just strip, it was just way too windy for wheels. So our only option, we had to go. There's no other way to get there. We're not gonna let troopers get killed or anybody else. We can prevent it. So we loaded uh, four of us into this 185 with over assault gear because shootout's still going on. And we landed on this horrible uh, Cusquim River. And as I came up there, it got to be a crosswind, an extreme crosswind. So it took full power, all the horsepower I could get out of that thing to ram it between two skips on the beach. I didn't care if I wrecked it. At that point, we just wanted to get to the village. And we did, and it uh, worked out okay, except for the shooter. Uh, this cut on ice, uh, the Cusquim River, they plow in the winter 355 miles this year, all the way to Sleep Mute and it becomes a state highway. And you enforce uh, all the traffic laws, has a speed limit, can't drive drunk, can't uh, do anything illegally, and so you enforce the laws. This is a sad story. Um, and um, this is a, a really crappy video because it's taken, it was recovered from the water and it was a VHS, but that's a water spout in the left top of the uh, lake. And we have two guys and the video is actually uh, not bad. I have the video. We have two guys on video and they were debating whether to go. They said last night their tent blew down. They had to retie down their cub twice. And then they panned the beach and they had this big old wall tent. They had uh, iron cookware. They had a metal stove with a big stand, big coffee pots. They had four caribou they, uh, that were quartered. They had uh, big lake trout. They had uh, four weapons between them and they weren't they weren't small guys. And they're debating whether to go. And they say, look at that water spout. And now we have to turn and get through these mountains to get to Antioch. Well, do you think they went or not? Unfortunately, they did. And uh, this, not, this is intentionally crappy because that's a body in the plane there in the yellow. The pilot was uh, recovered and we never found the passenger. He's still in the lake as far as we know. This is uh, our new office we got in Bethel when we were leaving and uh, we've got the city police guy. We've got a delegation from uh, Russia and uh, I'm in the picture somewhere. Now, this is where uh, I looked after three and a half years. The work in Bethel can be very stressful. I once went six months working very long shift with only two days off. The, the district attorney was arrested for shoplifting and he had a year of uncast paychecks in his desk door. So, stressful law enforcement. So one day, I'm gonna to have to admit this to everybody here, I found myself on the parking lot of the airport buying cocaine from a Croatian, Croatian uh, drug dealer. Fortunately, I was on a job working undercover. The bus led to the rest of a school teacher who had become a bootlegger and drug dealer to the villages. We seized all five airplanes on one day. Every one of them was a piece of junk in there, all were auctioned. Uh, but because of my work there, my, my uh, private uh, truck was sabotaged, my kids were at in school and we kind of never trusted uh, our aircraft or anything was safe. So I was kind of glad to get out of there. Now, if anybody is, uh, is ready at this point, and it's not gonna allow, but uh, unfortunately this is on YouTube and so it's not gonna play a YouTube, is it, Steve? Um, it doesn't work very well generally. Okay, so uh, you can get on YouTube and see a formation video. And this is a, a, a I mean, a recruitment video and that's really a good one. So if anybody wants to be a trooper, they, they could really use you. Um, now remember the bullets from the, the cabin shoot up, uh, shoot up uh, back in, I found on the, uh, where the guy who was turned out was shooting at a, at a uh, girl. Well, that turned out to be uh, the serial killer, Robert Hansen. And uh, he may have shot as many as 40 women. Uh, and what he would do, he'd take these girls off the street in Anchorage. He would um, take them to his house, abuse them for a while, handcuff them, throw them in the back of his cub, take them out, 
unhandcuff him, give him a, a running start, and then he'd hunt him as if they were game. And by all the marks he had on the charts where he had dumped bodies, uh, there were lots and lots of marks up to 40. That we never found the bodies. Unfortunately, a lot of these girls, nobody even reported them missing. But um, they made a movie about it. And um, because I had uh, was involved in the case and I was a cub pilot, I got a chance to fly in the movie. So this is a picture they made me send them so they could see if I uh, kind of looked a little bit like the killer. And that's what I look like. And that's before and that's after. That's after they dyed my hair, shaved my mustache and dressed me in dorky clothes and glasses. And uh, before and after, and this is Hanson. So uh, I was kind of a dead ringer for Hanson. Uh, it turns out I look just like Nick Kuzak our, our John Kuzak and Nicholas Cage going 100 miles an hour a mile away in the cup. So it was really great they made me shave my mustache. But I went in the Dan's aircraft one day in Anchorage and in this costume, I was getting the plane fixed and the guy in the office there, he wheels his chair back and pulls something out of his drawer. So, and, he, and he just looked at me with this action look on his face. And I said, howdy. And he recognized my voice and he said, I said, I'm Mike Kincaid. And he says, oh man, I thought you were Hanson and they'd let you out of prison or you had escaped. I was about to shoot you. <laughs> so I looked pretty much like the dirt bag. Uh, and then one night we're in the gravel pit. We're getting briefed to go fly in this um, Huey. And I hadn't met uh, Nicholas Cage yet. And so I'm just standing behind him for the briefing. And all of a sudden he looks at me, does a triple take. And then he goes, gets the director and starts uh, excitedly talking to him. The director turns back to me and starts laughing, brings Cage back and introduces me. And Cage thought I was the prisoner they'd let out of jail to consult on the scene, I guess. He didn't like that one bit. Don't blame him. This is uh, John Kuzak in a cub and he loved getting some duel. He had a lot of fun with it. Uh, he's better looking than me or uh, Hanson and uh, much taller as it turns out. One of the really hard parts of that job was working with the actresses. It was really hard, tough duty, uh, but I got to it. Uh, this is Nick Cage about to chase me. This is the lowest chase, speed chase scene you'll ever see in a movie. We're on the taxiway at Merrill Field in the snow. We're going maybe five miles an hour. We were on the river one day and, uh, and Nick is uh, in the helicopter and it's gusting to about 60 and raining sideways, horrible day. and. They just wanted him to be in the helicopter to get a shot. And he said, I'm not sitting in this thing. It's going to tip over. So they said, uh, Kincaid, come switch clothes with uh, Cage. We switched jackets and I took his glasses and um, he took my gear and uh, sat in the helicopter. And said, OK, well, this is easy. Uh, this is hazard. I'm getting hazard pay. I don't have to go anywhere. Well, the director decided since it wasn't a, a guy that they had to pay $50 million of coverage for, for insurance, like they did Kuzak, they could, uh, we'd go ahead and take off. So we took off in that canyon. It was a horrific flight. And we came back and he said, you know, I need another shot. So we did that twice. And I think that's the opening scene in the movie. So pr pretty good. This is the Matt Nuska River, uh, where uh, a lot of the movie was shot and uh, where a lot of the bodies were dropped. This is uh, a long, long ranger. We actually had the Ritter Ranger in Alaska, but I sent them pictures of the helicopter and uh, in Hollywood, they actually made these graphics and came up with it, did an amazing job. It turned the plane into a trooper helicopter for a day. This is actually an evergreen helicopter. And there's the gimbal I was talking about, Steve, that's, uh, that we had on the plane that uh, nice. Wolf Air makes. Yeah, pretty impressive. And here we are filming. And so they had one guy uh, doing the filming in the front there on the left side and then a guy in the back was editing as we fly. And they didn't have a really big lens on that gimbal. So uh, a couple of times a blade was over my wing and uh, scary, but they said, this is all normal. So I took their word for it. That's another video that's on YouTube of actually uh, flying in glaciers on the movie. It's pretty good. And there's a actress in the back that's freaking out because she's going to, she's been captured. The way this, by the way, the way this case was broken is one of the girls escaped at Merrill Field, ran across the uh, runway and bang, she's in handcuffs, she bangs on the tower door and they won't let her in. So she runs across the street and almost hit by a truck driver. 
And anyway, he calls the city police and uh, they dropped the ball on the case. And so the troopers took it over. And that's how the case was actually done. This is a, a scene uh, where Kuzak had already gone to another movie. So I had to play him uh, for this scene. And the, the deal was he was going to drop evidence. And it was a fall scene. Well, it hadn't snowed, it hadn't snowed. All of a sudden it snows like five feet in Anchorage. So we had to turn, they had to turn this snow back into fall. So they hired a bunch of guys with snow shovels and blowers and Herman Nelsons and and, uh, and I would fly cash, uh, envelopes full of cash and pay these guys in cash to keep them going. But they got to see him. And here I am leaving Alaska, <laughs> much nicer van. And I'm still not sure what my hurry was to leave, but here I am, uh, you come down the road in Glen Al or in, uh, Coeur d'Alene, this is what it looks like. And I thought, well, this is a good place to try for the summer. I've been here uh, 20 something years now. Uh, what I call North Idaho is like Alaska without the bugs. In Alaska, I thought I was a pretty good fisherman. Uh, these two giant halibut my wife caught, but the biggest of those two. But here's fishing here. Alaska, here. Alaska, here. It's different. That's for me, at least. That's my grandson, but uh, that's uh, kind of been my luck. I, I'm not a good fisherman. The fish are a lot smarter here. However, the people know what they're doing. This is one of the lakes I do splash and dashes on and you can catch big fish here. I just don't know how to do it. Uh, one thing I've got to say is the wildlife here is pretty amazing. Um, this is my backyard of our house and we live in a subdivision by the airport. And anybody recognize what that is? That's not a kitty cat, a cougar. They caught on our game camera. And uh, this is just how it is in the backyard. Oh, uh, we, every year we have a goose that comes back and builds a nest up on the hill above our house. That's our house down here. And this is kind of interesting. We caught on our camera one night, fighting off a raccoon. Unfortunately, the raccoon didn't win eventually. We got the eggs. There's some ducks, eagles. That guy, that guy. So we decided it would be a great idea to start a business here. Um, and I kind of failed as a retiree. So uh, for a while I flew for the statewide uh, drug task force here and flew for fish and game. And instead of counting salmon on a tight, in a tight canyon, I counted them on Lake Pend Oreille, uh, counted boats actually, and uh, mounted a tent on my lake and I tracked game. It was kind of fun to do it from a lake amphibian uh, using telemetry gear in the, in the lake. Uh, and then we decided to start a seaplane business, my wife and I. So here we are at Sandpoint, the Statue of Liberty in Sandpoint, beautiful beach there. And here we are uh, wakeboard behind the cup, Hayden Lake. Uh, this is uh, Upper Priest Lake. And this is uh, Killarney Lake. This is where Brooks Seaplane uh, hit uh, the uh, power line with their floats one time coming in here. And this is up on Lake Ponderé. This is how we take straight floats off. You've probably seen this. This is actually a 180 horsepower cub I was doing for a guy and um, he got a job after this, after flying us around up in Alaska flight scene and crashed unfortunately a, an otter in the mountains killed everybody on board, really sad. And here we are, uh, PA-12 taking off, Coeur d'Alene Airport. This is um, again, Upper Priest Lake, the beaver. This is the lake we had. And this is a great place uh, in Sandpoint. You wanna have uh, a meal? Great restaurant, you can fall right up to the beach. That's a friend of mine's Mallard. He has two of them. He has the first one and the last one ever made. This is going into Blue Lake. And it's a friend of mine's goose. He restored. And it's just my cub. And the reason I have that is because the guy came, the guy came down in the uh, Kodiak one day and said, hey, you want to go flying? And he had, happened to have a uh, instructor from Alaska I knew who had more hour in Kodiak than anybody. And so we went and did some splash goes. That's a wonderful airplane. Like the Beaver uh, in the other picture with the turbine, uh, more power than you need, I think. It's just incredible power. This is Savannah I had, which is really a fun little seaplane. That's my wife and I landing uh, on Lake Ponderay. 
It's kind of a cool cup, Addison Perkins. And Lake Ponderé is a neat place to go. It's 1,150 feet deep, which makes it the fifth deepest lake in the United States. And they test submarines there. And this is their small submarine. They have a really big one now. It's manned. This one was unmanned. Um, I met some uh, veterans from Afghanistan that wanted to start a brewery and they were making their beer in plastic jugs. So I invested in a brewery and it uh, that's the best beer I ever had. Incredible. I'm the uh, field director for Idaho, for the Seaplane Pilot Association for Idaho. If anybody ever wants to come up here and fly seaplanes, give me a call. We have a lot of splash ins here. Uh, we did before COVID hit anyway. These are just some, some, some of our splash ins. Uh, this guy uh, here is John Phillips, who had more, uh, he's an astronaut, had more time in, the, in space than anyone at the time, and uh, Bert Rutan and some other guys. Uh, this is one of the parties we had. We called these uh, the, the, the Bieber band. Uh, they were pretty good. There's a flying we had, a friend of mine's house. This is our hangar party we had. Uh, my wife and I went to a flight, my, our friend Stearman. And uh, a guy talked me into buying his BMW for some reason. It's more, almost much fun flying, driving to the airport it is flying now. Uh, another fly in, splash in, another one. Oh, these things are different here, how you go get airplanes, I found. Uh, we went to pick up this beaver at Spokane International in a friend's jet. And what's kind of interesting is we could get the thing out of customs for a couple of hours. And the reason is because the little stuff that they painted on instruments back in the old days, anybody know what that is? Uranium, I believe, uh, to make them glow. Well, that screwed up his sensor. And so he thought for sure it was something involving bombs. So he kept that plane in custody for a couple hours. So he finally called the manufacturer of those instruments. And he said, yeah, back in the 50s, we did use that. So we got two customs. This is a guy, I took him for a flight on his 90th birthday. And uh, that's, uh, name is Harold. And you see the big smile he has on his face? That's what you're supposed to have. That's what you're supposed to have. And it's such a neat guy, he ended up hearing his story and reading his diaries about his World War II trip. He worked on his PCR-851, which was like a, if you think of an ambulance ship, he'd race over and get victims of kamikaze attacks and get them to the hospital ship eventually. But it was a horrific job and, he, and so I wrote a book about it. Now, contrast to this guy, to this guy, see this big smile? And this guy, the big frown, this was actually to show what he should have done to his plane to put mirrors on it. But I will, uh, after a flight, I'll show my uh, wife pictures of my students. And she said, why are you flying with that guy? He's got a big old frown on his face, looks miserable. And I said, because if I don't, he's gonna kill himself in this plane. It was no gear advisory system at all. So after our first flight, a couple of hours, I didn't charge him for it. I just gave him a list of things to do for his plane. I said, put some mirrors on it. Uh, the gear selector was upside down the cockpit. I get that fixed. And uh, just a list of things to do, markers on the floats with, with paint. And it's pretty simple things. The only way we could tell if the gear was up is by looking out the window and you could see from each side, you could see the nose gear was up if, for landing on water. You're, you're okay. So we checked it three times for landing on water that day. By the way, I told him, we're not gonna fly until you get these things fixed. Well, my rule is safety first, it always has been, but uh, I broke that rule. He showed up and he's he a CPA and he said, hey, I'm, uh, I just got a half hour of the fly, can you go fly with me? And I said, have you fixed anything on the plane? He said, oh, I haven't, but I went right after this flight. So like a dummy, climbed in the plane and uh, we flew over the lake and I looked out, my gear was up we checked it three times and landed and flipped. Well, what had happened, there's a hydraulic leak. You can see my side is up, his side is down. The hydraulic leak started and the main gear, where one of them was almost all the way down. So we flipped. And like the good doctor says, and uh, like Bill said, uh, it's pretty exciting to go upside down in the water. Uh, the temperature of OAT was about, 42 and the water was 40, I think. Um, and 
I remember thinking as I'm in there trying to get out, I'm looking at the mountains, the snow-capped mountains in the distance and thinking, this is a pretty place to die because I'm not getting out of this one. Um, the passenger door jammed. I found out later the airplane was never uh, certified, never modified for floats. It didn't have the beef up kit, so the door jammed, didn't have any support. Couldn't get the door open. And my shoulder wasn't working very well either. So I'm trapped in the seat belts, um, can't get out. And um, so as the rather rotund pilot uh, egressed, the plane started rolling to my side, of course. And then it began a slow tip uh, into, the, into the water. And that turned out to be a good thing. As it started rolling into the water, the cockpit started filling you see, with uh, water because you see the windscreen open. And uh, as it filled with water, my seatbelt started giving me some room between me and my chest. And I was able to, to start getting loose got the seatbelt untangled, it was a big tangled mess. And my headset was tangled in it too. But I was able to get some flotation and, and gave me some room from the harness belt and I was able to get free. And so I started climbing, uh, swimming to the pas passenger or pilot door. And the pilot, instead of offering a hand, he said, hey, would you swim to the back and get my log books to the uh, baggage area? So I did. How did I get into this mess? Well, I broke, up, I broke uh, my own rule of refusing an instructor to fly in unsafe planes. Um, a guy once told me, he said that he, he before he gives a tailwheel uh, flight, he's a tailwheel instructor, he says, I do an attitude test. I talk to the guy on phone, and if he fails the attitude test, I don't fly with him, and I should have. I gave up my seaplane business, gave my seaplane plane, uh, business to a new guy, and I concentrate on being a DPE, giving check rides. But actually my heart was never into it really again. So officially retired after a couple more years just to concentrate now on having fun. This is, uh, illustrates a point Bill made uh, when he flipped his plane on uh, in Alaska. He said something very smart. He said, when you flip the plane over, do it very slowly and let the water escape, right? Otherwise, what happens? This happens, the plane breaks in half. They got in too big a hurry. They wouldn't, they wouldn't, uh, they just used a crane and popped it over without letting any water escape. Beautiful airplane got destroyed. This is a plane we took to Alaska actually. And then they destroyed the boat, the, the floats loaded on a trailer. The floats cost $94,000 today and they were in fine shape. Uh, here's the, the survival vests that we wear. Uh, these are great stormy seas. And again, what you're wearing is what you may survive with. So we have all kinds of stuff in the uh, pockets to survive on, but we have the the little ELT, the PFD, uh, or the uh, ELT strobe attached to the, right to the vest. These are the most comfortable ones I've ever used. They don't make them anymore, unfortunately. Uh, we have a guy here I got to be friends with called Bert Rutan, and I think you maybe know he's getting the Hoover Award today. Um, this is him and his wife, Tanya, on Lake Coeur d'Alene with the famous floating green. This is his ski goal. Uh, that he built. And I won't show you the picture in the water because it's uh, not fair to, to Bert, but let's just say it didn't work out as a seaplane. So uh, here's Bert and I flying in uh, one of my cubs up on uh, Priest Lake. And so when he realized that he's not getting any younger and he needs to get a plane he can fly in local lakes, uh, Addison and Pemberton and I tried to convince him to buy a cub on Amphibs. Instead, he bought a Super Petrol. Anybody know what that is? Okay, well, it's probably a wonderful plane for Florida. It's my friend's goose and uh, article I wrote for water flying. And uh, I'm sure Bill, if he's watching this, would recognize this. This is Swan Lake. And this is the story I wrote. And uh, six days and five nights to Alaska. Don't ever do it that quickly. You have a lot more fun taking your time. This is some more of our flying here. Look at this is Priest Lake. Um, or excuse me, that is Lake Pond Array, and that's Priest Lake. And this is Hayden Lake. This is Addison, another uh, and a guy named Lil Fennick who owns the Mallards too, flying over the canola fields. This is Sullivan Lake, beautiful place to fly into. And this is Amy uh, from Upland flying with me. I mean, that's real service. She came up and checked the floats out with me that summer. This is a friend of mine's place. And this is really neat because uh, you don't land on the water, but there's a strip right here in this lodge up above Sandpoint, beautiful spot. And this is Lake Ponderay again. Um, I hope this one works. Oh, this one will need it. That's too bad because this, if you get a chance to go on my YouTube, this is really good. Uh, we call this the Benoit Creek News Camp Approach, but it's really a fun. You go down a canyon, land on the lake. 
Uh, Fourth of July fly over Coeur d'Alene and every year the um, newspaper puts a cub flying the colors on the front page like this year. Kind of neat. Uh, this is a book I wrote for seaplane training. This is my Sea Ray mistake. I bought a Sea Ray thinking it'd be an ideal plane. It's kind of like a Super Petrol, probably great for Florida. Uh, horrible in any kind of uh, chop or turbulence and horrible on any kind of choppy water. This is my uh, my current Super Cub and I bought this as a wreck and the best thing I have to this plane is it wrecked by the college down the Walla Walla and it got sent to uh, John Pike in Oregon who's a master builder. Uh, John did a really good job on restoring it and he actually called the college and said man this thing isn't worth restoring uh, and they said it's okay we've got really good insurance. So he went from the spinner to the tail and rebuilt everything. It spent many years in Alaska and had a lot of corrosion and so he repaint, re Actually, it's got just about everything new in it, fuselage, everything. This is how it looked when I got it, plain Jane. And uh, this is how it looks after we put some graphics on it. And here we are at a fly-in. Now, this is uh, one of my first flights after we got it here and checked it out. And we took the panels off just to make everything sure everything was great. And this is instant karma because I flew up to the strip. And I saw this guy's airplane and I, it was really nice to him, of course. I said, that's a beautiful plane you have there. But I was kind of chuckling to myself. So I took off from this strip and the, uh, my Super Cub, the, the rudder jammed. Well, this strip, you, generally you take off going to North here and you have to outclimb that terrain. It jammed so much that I'm in the, kind of a slip going up there, up the uh, valley and not gaining much altitude. And I've kind of elected, well, what can I do? I could crash into the trees or whatever. I'm not sure exactly what, decided, what to do, but I decided to just keep going. And I got some altitude and climbed up and it was got real bumpy over the hills. So I couldn't really do uh, much to try to figure out what it was. So I flew back and texted a couple mechanics and said, well, I'm gonna be crashing at Coeur d'Alene in about 10 minutes, uh, be watching for me. Cause I figured it was gonna be a sideways crash. And uh, got over Hayden Lake and just started hitting the rudders really hard. And finally it popped loose. What it was is when it, me or somebody else, it's probably me and probably my fault, took the panel off to left, didn't attach the screws all the way. So the left rudder pedal got caught up in the side panel takeoff. Very lucky. Uh, this is a fire boss. Uh, I've done an article on this one and this one. Both of these planes come here to fight fires. And we have a lot of fires here. This article just came out yesterday in Waterfly and somebody gets that. And these are some of the check cards I gave. This is a bill. Uh, he got his uh, initial private pilot in his plane on Amphibs. So it went right to private pilot in the seaplane. And this gal, uh, Emma, she uh, got her private, uh, her add-on and she went up to uh, met a guy in Canada and they got married in the Yukon and have a uh, flying business up there. And this is Tanya Rutan. She got her private pilot and straight floats, initial private pilot. This guy had this uh, neat cub and he'd fly over and for some reason he didn't use it for training and used the PA-12, got his uh, add-on rating and then I think he bought an Icon. Don't know why. This gal uh, got her single engine C add-on and then uh, her dad let her check out in her Stearman. So she flies a Stearman now. This gal now flies for Horizon. This is part of our check ride. We landed and did the oral part of the check ride on a spot on Lake Coeur d'Alene. She's flying for Horizon. Okay, this is a story, um, and Amy Hoover might talk about this next week. I had a student that came here from Colorado, and every uh, examiner has something that's their pet peeve. Mine is clearing turns, and make sure you lift a wing before you make a turn, and look for traffic. And the instructor told me this guy was having a real problem with that. Well, the day of the check ride, it turned out to be too hot between people on the lake. So we just sat on the beach and talked and talked to why you need to clear a turn. He says, well, I never thought about that. I never was trained to ever, ever lift a wing and ever look. So he did a really good job on the uh, check ride the next day, lifted the wing. I gave him a ride to uh, the airport, my Jeep, and loaded up his 172. And he took off to go down and fly with Amy for mountain flying and crashed into Amy in midair. Amy, hopefully, will tell you the story. She, she made a really good line and survived and didn't work out for him. Lift your wing, clear turns, please. Uh, this is another crash. We, uh, my dog and a, we, a friend of mine made this uh, airplane. It was actually a real airplane. 
and took it because a rich guy wanted an ornament for his tree. And so we stuck it in the tree. People probably heard about this. This is Brooks seaplane crash. And I started out talking about my fear of flying is because when I was uh, in the first grade, um, a mid-air collision happened over me. Um, pieces of the plane came into our schoolyard. Uh, the jet fighter crashed on the mountains. The pilot bailed out. The, the radio man didn't survive. The uh, plane, I believe it was a DC-4, landed in another schoolyard a few miles from ours and uh, killed some kids. And Richie Valens happened to be uh, going to that school and he was at his father's or grandfather's funeral that day or he would have been in the playground. So he developed a fear of flying too. And as you know, Richie uh, killed in a crash. Uh, here's part of the editing process. So here's my book cover for Alaska Pursuit. My wife does a proofreading then it goes to a attorney who's an editor and then it goes to the bookseller and on and on down the line. That's my cover. Here's the cover that came out. <laughs> They said the, the girl was not appropriate, so they draped the, draped the flag over. Uh, this is the test Bill Russ series about whether a uh, seaplane is a babe magnet or not. I don't know. Uh, but sometimes uh, we're not all babes. Sometimes they're uh, a wheel planes and they're dogs. That's my dog's guy. Okay, here's a bonus question. Uh, this is the last one to end this. Uh, anybody can tell me what kind of plane it is in the country of registration. Steve? Yeah, you, you, you have Mike, so you can, you can. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, I could cheat and Google it, but actually what it looks like to me is an end number backwards. There you go. Okay, you got the country, right? You got the United <laughs> States. What kind of plane? Uh, it looks, let's see, anybody type in an answer down here? No. Um, i give you a hint. Okay. It's a turn for the worst. Oh, it's a turn, Arctic turn. There you go. That's what a guy, a cub pilot called him and I said, asked him what he thought about it. He said, oh, it's a turn for the worst. I tell you, <laughs> Arctic turn. This guy on the left here, he was, he got right out of uh, aviation school and he got a job. And Kodiak, and then they set him to King Sam, and we became friends. And he flew out with this buddy and got this uh, Royal Set. The guy said, You need to go back and get the Uzik. So, what does he do? He takes the company's 207, lands on the beach with the 207 to get the Uzik. The tide comes in. <laughs> and it was a sad story from them on. The 207 got washed out, partially out to sea. That's all I have, folks. Mike, wow. <laughs> That's quite a life. Thank you. Very nice. Great, great story. So, and how many, so how many books have you written? Uh, about six, uh, I guess, in total. Very good. I don't know if anybody has any questions. Got some thank yous and some things like that coming along. Oh, Tom Ford says it's a turn after, but he's 20 seconds delayed on YouTube. So he's a little late with the answer. I'm sure he knew. <laughs> <Not a number. laughs> So uh, very nice, really appreciate your time. This is a, a great program and uh, just what a, what a fascinating life you've had. And uh, you know, I have, I have, I can't remember which one of your books that I have that, that is on the list of things to read, but, uh, but I'm, I'm more looking forward to doing that now. So, and can, where can people get, if people were interested in, in doing some more and, uh, and reading one of your books, where, where would they find those? Um, Amazon's best place. Okay. And if anybody happens to come to this way, give me a call or send me an email. And um, I got a tie down spot outside my hangar. If there's room inside the hangar, you can always put your plane in there, but uh, stop by and say hi. Got, we got some really, uh, as many of you know, some really wonderful country here to fly. Well, thank you again, Mike. We sure appreciate your time. Uh, next week, folks, it'll be Laura and I doing a little program on going to the Bahamas. So you may want to skip next week. Um, and uh, then the last, <laughs> the last weekend of the month is uh, is Amy Hoover, and uh, not sure what's happening the week after next. Maybe something we might get. You might get a bye week. We'll see. So everybody, uh, this weekend, go home and root for the Kansas City Chiefs, and uh, you'll uh, <laughs> hopefully that'll work out for us there too. Hey Steve, you know what team they really are, don't you? What's that? The Dallas Texans. Oh, there you go. I saw the first game they ever played in person. They played the Dallas Cowboys in an exhibition game. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks.